Uh, yes, thank you, Addy. Thanks for asking me to, uh, to deliver this lecture, well, a topic I'm quite passionate about. And, and actually, get from my, from my biography, I've done a, a whole bunch of things, but I am first and foremost an engineer. That's what I've been doing for 25 years of my life. Uh, but I also have a PhD in marketing, and that's probably an odd combination. Some of you might ask, well, wh how, how does that work? What does engineering have anything to do with marketing? And I asked myself that very question about 10 years ago. So I started an MBA. Because uh, as an engineer, most of you will start your career doing very technical stuff, a lot of mathematics, that's what I used to do. But for those of you who move on, you start doing management. And for most of my career, I've been managing projects and make it, making sure that uh, the resources are available, et cetera, and, and specifications are met. And then the natural choice for an engineer is then to do an MBA. And the, the original idea of an MBA was actually targeted for engineers to teach us about management. My very first lecture was about uh, the now late uh, Professor Red Walker, Hill Trope University. And he, um, he asked everybody in the room to say, well, what, what is your definition of marketing? What do you think marketing is? And with my philosophy background, um, I, I responded um, quite facetiously, and I said, marketing is about selling people things they don't need. Because a lot of marketing is about that. It's about advertising and pushing your things, and you all see it on TV. But Red said to me, you're wrong. I'm going to work on you. I'm going to convince you that you're wrong. And through his lectures, and, I, and I, um, I've done several subjects with him, I got really enthralled in the subject, and I found it fascinating because I learned actually what I've been doing in my career, a lot of them had to do with marketing. And I'm going to explain to you now what marketing is, so that's the first part of, my, of this, of this uh, lecture. And in the second part, I'm going to apply that to engineering to try to convince you that the knowing about marketing will actually help you as an engineer and will, will help you to create better products. So when you mention the word marketing, the first thing people will think about is logos and advertising and selling stuff. And you probably recognize 75% of these logos. Um, but that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to marketing. That's only the stuff that you see. There's a whole process underneath all this, um, all this advertising and all this um, stuff you see on TV. That is a whole process. And if you want to find a definition about marketing, um, I started Googling it, and there's a blogger, Heidi Cohen, and she collected 76 different definitions of marketing. Most of those were, were by practitioners. There's a whole bunch of academic uh, definitions as well. And being involved in data science, I thought to myself, I'm not actually going to read all these definitions and try to analyze them. I'll let the computer do that for me. So I wrote a script that downloaded all these um, uh, definitions, cleaned up the text, uh, analyzed the word frequencies, and then visualized it behind me. So what you see in there is that marketing is about customers. That's the largest word. That's the word that appears the most. And it's about products and services. It's about communication. Uh, there's other words in there like um, this market is qu quite obviously. There's um, brand, media, message, people, consumer. So a lot of it is about people. But this is not really a definition. This still doesn't tell you much. So I'm going to share with you the definition of the um, American Association of Marketing, I want to take that apart. So this definition says marketing is the activity, the set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value, and I'll highlight that word, for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. So that's what the American marketing definition says. Now let's take that apart. So the first part of this definition says that marketing is an activity. It's a set of institutions. What I mean by institutions is sort of patterns of doing, sort of traditional ways of doing things. It's about processes. So okay, we, we get that. The next part is, is important. What, what is actually the stuff that these people do? They create, communicate, deliver, and exchange offerings. And an offering is anything that is offered to a market. Well, that's what you guys do. You create stuff. You then... Um, deliver it, and you, and you also need to communicate it, which is probably something that engineers are not that good at. Um, and you exchange it, because when I worked in contracting, um, we received a, a tender, and then we build a thing, we build a harbor, we build a bridge, and we gave that to the client. So that fits in that definition. And the key phrase is here, offerings that have value for customers, clients, and partners, and society overall. So traditionally, marketing really looked at just saying, okay, we have a business and a customer, and it's just this one-to-one -one relationship. It's called a dyadic relationship, just from one person to the next. But the latest definitions of marketing, they recognize there's actually more happening there. There's a whole network of people that are involved. 
Uh, customers is a very generic word, but you are students, you're also a form of customer. When you go to the doctor, you're also a customer, but they call you a patient. Uh, with the water utility, some people call you rate payers. So there's lots of different words for, um, for, the, for the beneficiary of these processes. And the part that I really like is that this new idea of marketing, that's, it's not quite new, it's about 50 years old, is about marketing is about value, providing value to society overall. And being a civil engineer, that's exactly what it is that we do. Because think about for a minute what the word civil engineer actually means. The reason it's called civil engineering is because it had to be distinguished in the 19th century from military engineering. Military engineering is about killing people, civil engineering is about helping people. But really, civil comes from the Latin word civilis, which means people, society at large. So that's what we civil engineers, and in fact all engineers do, we create value for society. So this definition, I believe, applies to engineering or any other process that, that tries to improve the world. Yes, it also applies to people selling washing powder and um, uh, soft drinks and all that sort of the fast-moving consumer goods, um, but marketing is more than that. The key, um, the key word in this definition is creating value. But what does that mean? Because value is a very subjective uh, concept. What is valuable to me might not be valuable to you or valuable to any, anyone else. But there are ways to, um, to assess what is valuable. And at, at its uh, simplest, value is when there's a difference between the cost and the benefits, a positive difference from your perspective. And economists, um, they often just look at the monetary part of it. So if I buy a car for $20,000, um, I, might get, I might get some economic value out of that. And for business, that's a quite an easy equation. And part of what you will do as an engineer, a lot of that, especially if you uh, work for a client like myself, where I've, I've spent hundreds of millions of dollars in my career. And what it's all about is assessing whether the money that I spend creates value for the business. In other words, will the organization that I buy this bridge for get more out of it or this water treatment plant, is that worth $10 million? And there's a whole bunch of economics around that. And, and I spent a lot of my career actually doing that work, doing all this net present value analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But wait, there's more. There's more to value. There's also a, a time cost for the consumer. And this is a very important uh, aspect, especially in, in engineering, because a lot of what engineering does is increasing convenience for humans. Now think about uh, water. Water is an interesting example. Think about the images you might see on TV of people in Africa that spend four to six hours a day to get their daily water. The water is free, it's just from the river. Besides that, it might kill you, uh, it is free. But they spend most of their time um, obtaining that water. So there's a huge opportunity cost for them. They could spend that time actually going to school. They could spend that time probably more in a more valuable way. So there's a huge time cost. Think about the amount of time you spent to obtain your daily water. It is negligible. And there's some interesting research in, elect in electricity, in, in illumination. An economist uh, did a lot of experiments trying to work out the time cost that people uh, spent on illumination from prehistory to now. So imagine um, you're, you you're a cave, caveman or a cavewoman and you have to light up the cave. So you have to rub sticks together and do all that stuff and get your wood. So you probably spend a few hours a day to, to get your illumination. Then we had gas lights and candles and, and the amount of time people had to spend to get their light. So the amount of convenience kept increasing. Now you flick the switch and light comes on. So the time cost is something we try to reduce. And this is the reason people build new highways because it uh, decreases the amount of time people spend on the road and they can use that time more valuable. There's also an energy cost. Uh, it's more like a psychological uh, energy. Um, if you buy something, especially when it's fashion or a car or those sort of things that, that uh, define you as a person, there is a, a social, uh, there's a risk that you take uh, because the reason we buy certain clothes is because, because we want to belong to a certain social group. The reason I wear a suit, because that's what managers wear. That's just the way things work. It's not because this is, this is my preferred choice of clothing. Um, if we didn't have those sort of social rules, we'd all be sitting here in sweatpants and t-shirts. But so uh, we, there's a social cost of doing that, so therefore we, we comply with certain rules. And then the benefits are, are more than that, um, just the benefits the product delivers, and I'll 
tell you a little bit more about that because this, this I think is very important for engineers. You probably heard people talk about the difference between needs and wants. And there's a common sense understanding of what a need and a want is. So I've got this little image here of the, of the little girl with the apple and the lolly. And you can imagine the conversation she might have had with her mother. She said, Mom, I, want the, I need a lolly. No, no, you don't need a lolly. You want a lolly. You need an apple. That's sort of the, the common sense definition. And we all understand why that is from health benefits, etc. Marketers look at it a very different way. A need and a want are very different things. Um, a need is a, a, felt state, a, a felt state of deprivation. So in other words, there is a difference between what you want to be and what you actually are. So the reason this girl might want a lolly is not because she's hungry. It's because her friend has one too. Or she wants that one because she wants a bigger lolly than her friend. And that's important to her. And why is that important? Now, you might have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of need. It's a theory um, from a, a psychologist, a humanist psychologist, Abraham Maslow, who in the 1940s came up with this idea. And at that time, much of psychology was influenced by Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud, he um, had a very negative view of human beings. It was all about uh, our, everybody was sexually frustrated and, and hated their parents and all those sort of things. And, that, and that, according to Freud, that was really driving our behavior. And Maslow and other humanist psychologists, they said, no, no, this is, this is too negative. We need a positive view of human psychology. And that's how he came up with this hierarchy. And in this hierarchy, he said, the first need that we have is physiological. We need to survive. We need food, we need water, and we need air. And it's very basic, very simple. At the second level, we have a need for safety. We have a need to be safe from the elements. We have a need to be safe from... Predators, if, if you live in a sort of an ancient society, we have, or we have a need to be safe from human predators. The third level, and this is where this lolly example perhaps comes in, is a need for love and belonging. We want to belong to a social group, and a lot of that drives our purchase behavior. So a marketer would say, this girl has a need for a lolly because she wants to belong to a social group. Now, whether that is ethically the best, best choice, that's a, diff, that's a different discussion. But separating needs and wants from the common sense definition, looking at it this way, will drive you to understand psychology better. Because at the next level, we have self-esteem. So we buy products to increase our self-esteem. And at the highest level, according to Maslow, is self-actualization. This is really, the, the, um, the, according to them, the meaning of life. This is the purpose of being a human being self-actualization. That's the reason you guys are here. You want to self-actualize yourself in the future. But also perhaps a university education, the reason you purchase that, is a bit of esteem because you want to be an engineer and there's, a, there's, a, there's an esteem associated with that. Um, love and belonging, um, part of being a professional engineer as you further into your career is also being part of a group of engineers. So I'm a member of several professional organizations and that's great because there's like-minded people that I can talk to. Um, and we can apply this Maslow hierarchy of need also to engineering. And this is an example from, from the water industry. So what we do is we sell tap water. Very simple. And 10 years ago there was a massive drought in Victoria and the drought was so severe that the city of Bendigo, which has got uh, roughly 100,000 people, had only about two months' worth of water left. And it's like, you probably heard about day zero in Cape Town. Well, we had that, and we fixed it. Uh, we spent $150 million to fix it, but that's, that was an engineering problem. The issue was that while we didn't have enough water, we had to tell our customers that they were not allowed to use water in their gardens. And that we didn't quite understand how dramatic that decision actually was. And think about the needs that gardening actually meets. Because as a utility, as engineers, we could say, you don't need a garden, you just want one. You know, remember that mother, they say, you, you, you don't need a lolly, you, um, you just want one. And we said to our customers, you don't need a garden, you just want one. So, no, no more garden. But think about what garden actually does. For a lot of elderly people, there's a physiological need for the garden. Because it's probably the only time they get some exercise and they go out and they do their bits and plot around the garden. There's also a safety need. Um, a garden is a nice safe space where you can be by yourself. People like to be behind massive big fences so you can walk around without clothes or whatever it is you like to do. Um, 
there's a sense of love and belonging because the garden is a place where you invite your mates for your for a barbecue. So that's also a need that a garden meets. The garden also meets the need for self-esteem. I've designed my own garden, I've built it, spent 10 years doing that. It's a, a huge source of self-esteem for me. And last but not least, the garden is also a source of self-actualization. So the garden is not just a want, it's a human need from a marketing perspective. And if you understand that, if you understand how customers, how are the users of your engineering product, how that associates with their deeper psychology, I think you'll be able to build better products. I have a little case study. Um, you all know Uber, you're probably customers of Uber, and you, you must, admit, must be aware of the massive um, uh, controversies that were around the world when Uber came in, in what were licensed uh, state-sanctioned monopolies, really, for the regular taxi industry. And it was a massive tension. And Uber is a fascinating organization, and a lot of, or, a lot of other companies want to be as cool as Uber. <coughs> And everybody, in, uh, when they talk about Uber, they talk about the app. Oh, they're using the internet, and they have this app, and it's all fantastic. And also in my industry, a lot of people are now talking about the digital water utility. We have to be just as cool as Uber. We have to be just as cool as all these other companies. I personally don't understand what digital water utility means, because water will always come out of the tap. It will always weigh a ton per cubic meter, and you always have to push it uphill. There's no magic to it. Uh, but um, interestingly... Uber wants to be as cool as water utilities. This is from their website. This is their strategy. They want to deliver transportation that is as reliable as running water. So that makes me proud because that says, hey, these cool companies like Uber, they want to be as cool as us. And when I showed it to my colleagues, they're like in disbelief because all we see is the engineering problems. What we don't, understand, what we don't often uh, realize is that we deliver one of the most reliable products on the planet. But there's, there's a little issue behind Uber. And I have a little video that uh, demonstrates um, uh, what the issue is and, and how marketing is more than just delivering products. Nobody takes jobs away from us. We need to speak to Mayor and tell her to shut down this illegitimate business. Or maybe we could have the police shut him down. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't you guys just make your cars cleaner and nicer and try to be better to your customers so that you can compete with handy cars popularity in the marketplace? Just ignore my friend. He's mentally disabled. Oh. Uh, don't mind me. This little South Park clip nails on the head what um, marketing is about. It's not about just pushing stuff and selling stuff. It's also provi providing a good customer experience. And what this, what this little clip illustrates is that what marketing is really about is providing a good customer experience and the same as with the engineering products that you'll be creating you need to make sure that your products give the customer a good experience that's what it's all about whether it's driving on a road and whether it's uh, using some um, um, using an app if you're a software engineer whether it's uh, any other whether driving a car it doesn't matter it's about the customer experience and in engineering one of the things I did um, in my fourth year, it was traffic engineering, and we, um, we had a, a little subject called traffic psychology, which was all about working out how a, how a, uh, a driver experiences the highway to make sure they make the right decisions based on the visual information they receive. And that's exactly uh, what marketing is also about, is that about that customer experience. So now I've got, for the rest of this uh, lecture, some examples. I'm going to really link it to engineering, and hopefully I'll, uh, it will start make more sense to you. In the, in the end of the 1960s, uh, two marketing scholars, Philip Kotler and Sidney Levy, uh, Kotler is now one of the main marketing uh, gurus who writes pretty much every textbook that they use in MBAs around the world. They wrote this paper, and in this paper they started recognizing that marketing is more than just selling washing powder. It's more than just selling stuff. And um, They started to recognize that marketing is also something that public services can use. And this is how this whole idea of uh, anti-tobacco advertising, for example, that comes out of this, this idea. And this paper brought in the concept of marketing. This is one line that I really love. And when I read that, I, ne I nearly fell off my chair. Marketing is customer satisfaction engineering. Uh, I thought, I was just, it's, you know, sometimes you read a paper and you just think you found a piece of gold, and that's, that's the one that I found. Because A, there's the direct link between marketing and engineering, which, which I like, but that also makes sense. So, Customer satisfaction, in those days, that's what we now call value. But customer satisfaction is a lot more narrower concept than value. 
But why does he call it engineering? Because engineering has in common with marketing that it's a process-based problem solving. How that works in marketing, and, and this is an example, it's called the service blueprint. So one of the things marketers need to do when you manage a service is to manage the customer experience. And imagine you want to go out for tea tonight. So what you do, you ring, you ring your favorite restaurant to book a seat. You show up, you eat, you pay, you leave. For, so for you, that's a very simple process. And within that, a lot of things can happen. And your uh, experience um, can be different depending on how rude your, um, your waiters are, um, how easy your um, check-in process is. But what this process map does, it explains the whole process, but also the stuff that happens backstage. So, and so often in marketing, they talk about front stage and backstage. So front stage is what you as a customer experience, and backstage is what happens in the kitchen and the booking office and all that other stuff. And what this process diagram tries to do is to make sure that the customer experience is seamless. It tries to make sure that the whole process is efficient because they don't want to waste time on their side either. And this is a technique, and that, because it's a service blueprint. Now, blueprint is engineering. But process mapping is something that engineers do a lot. The original management guru. And in the 1950s, he wrote a, um, a fascinating book, um, The Practice of Management. And it's, it's still valid. It's, it's an amazing piece of work. There's a few lines in there that I find very interesting. But this one here, early on in the book, he talks about marketing is the activity that informs the engineer, the designer, and the manufacturing man, but back in those days it was all about men, um, what customers want. So he started to recognize that engineers and marketers need to work together. And that's still a bit of a hot issue. There's still engineers and marketers, there's a lot of tension there, because marketers and engineers have a very different education. And I'll delve, delve into that um, later on. And I've got an example. This is a real-life example of, of my own job. One of the things we are doing is uh, we are upgrading our water meters to fit a transmitter on it and a, a data logger. So smart meters, as, as, as they are commonly known, we call them digital meters. And one of the issues we found is that in winter, um, a lot of the meters, especially in the higher areas, Trenton, is about 500 meters above, above sea level, a lot of the meters freeze because water meters in Australia are outdoors. And for years, we had engineers looking at this problem, talking to the manufacturer, trying to find out why water freezes, which is pretty obvious, but um, everybody thought there was an engineering solution to it, um, some smart solution. But what we did um, for years, every winter, we communicate with customers and tell them, customers, it's getting cold now, please protect your water meter. And we've done that for, for decades. And customers have been very creative, as you see, with coming up with solutions to prevent their water meter from freezing. So this is sort of um, crowdsourced engineering, if you like. But now comes the era of Facebook. We started, our, we started our journey into Facebook, and we put this message on Facebook last year to say, dear customers, it will be getting cold. Your meter might freeze. Please make sure you cover your meter. And the beauty of Facebook, other than other, any other communication um, tool where nobody talks back to you, all of a sudden the vitriol came back at us, saying, call of water, you are idiots. It is your water meter. We pay you good money for you to protect your water meter. And I read that and was like, they're right. And uh, we've done this for, for decades. And so we were not customer-centric. We were thinking about our own, about our own patch. So that's a problem statement. So the lines above there is like a typical simplified engineering process. So here's my problem. But this problem, what is, what is marketing about this, is that it's cust purely customer driven. The customers have given us a problem. And then what I had to do is actually shop that problem around the business to convince my colleagues that it actually is a problem. So the next step was uh, design. We had to design a solution. Now our customers have been very creative, as you saw, with little metal pigs and car tires and all sorts of things. We wanted something a little bit more industrial. A commercial solution was available. There's a company in Western Victoria and they make little plastic molds and that sort of fitted. Um, but our problem was that didn't fit over the digital um, setup. So we had some of our engineering students to come up with a new solution. And when I was watching a documentary on Netflix about the toy, toy manufacturing, they used an interesting technique called kit bashing. 
And what they mean by kit bashing is that you take a toy from another manufacturer or from your own product line, and you then mold it, file it, and cut it, and do whatever you like with it to create a new toy. So rather than developing something from scratch. So I said, okay, we can do that. So I um, gave the guys a credit card, sent them to Bunnings, and say, buy anything that you think looks like a, that could protect the meter from frost. And they came up with a whole bunch of, a whole boxes of plastic and now rubbish, but one interesting idea that I liked <coughs> is um, the thick PVC plastic from a bistro blind. I wrapped that around the meter with some Velcro or buttons we weren't quite sure yet. That looked all right. Um, you see um, Nick there is looking at... Uh, like a plunger that he tried to fit over the meter. So they tried a whole bunch of things. And then we got a few people together, a bit like a shark tank, saying, okay, which one is really the good idea? In the end, the commercial product won because it was available, it was cheap, and we found a way to modify it to suit the digital uh, device. So that's what, that was our design stage. We tried to be innovative. Then at, uh, what we've done so far is we've uh, deployed 1,500 of these, the, these covers, and that's what, it's, what it now looks like. Um, what will be really interesting for me is now the next phase, which is the operational phase. Now, I can't tell you yet what the results are because this winter is still ongoing, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the next October to start looking at the data. And this is the data analysis I did to analyze how big the problem is. So on this map behind me, I downloaded data from the Bureau of Meteorology, and I put that on, on, a, on a heat map, or a cold map, if you like. Um, and the bubbles are where the most frozen meters occur. And it's quite obvious that most of them occur in the south, in the higher regions. But we were quite surprised that it happens quite often in the north as well. This is how, a, uh, how customer feedback can drive a new product, uh, product in, my, uh, in my industry. So I spoke about some of the conflicts between um, engineers and marketers and, and, and the differences. And here's what the difference is. Engineers, you guys, and, and, and my original education is all about physics and mathematics, and it's very precise. If you have a problem, you put some numbers in the formula, and the solution rolls out at the end. That's the textbook way. The reality is not that, never that neat, but it's all quite mathematical and quite predictable. On the other hand, dealing with customers is a social science, and social sciences and the physical sciences have very different methodologies, very different ways of thinking. Um, and through, in my educational journey, um, I, I think I was lucky that I've done a bit of both. So for me, doing a philosophy degree straight, straight after my engineering degree was really helpful um, because it helped me to understand um, what engineering is really about. So it helped me to understand what, me what methodology is really about, but also um, ethics, etc. And then doing a marketing degree, it was all really about social sciences. And here's some examples about how and this creates a tension and how, how this tension plays out. Now, border in, in networks, um, there's lots of different ways of looking at it. And our main responsibility as a water utility is to make sure that nobody gets sick from drinking the water. Because before there were water utilities, people used to die from drinking water. It still happens in a lot of other places around the world where there's no improved water sources. Um, I've recently done some work in Vietnam to help a water utility there, and people can't drink the water, so they use enormous amounts of bottled water. So drinking water, um, water that is drinkable, portable water, is extremely important to us, and we spent a lot of time, and a lot of my data analysis is about making sure that the water is drinkable. But what that means, that is a very stem-oriented approach to looking at things, because it's all about milligrams per liters and E. coli and coliforms and other chemicals and whatever might be in the water. And water chemistry is actually quite complex and subtle. But customers look at it a very different way. Customers are not interested in those numbers. They don't understand them. They probably don't want to understand them. And I think they shouldn't need to understand them. Because remember, we want to provide a good customer experience. But here's the tension. <clears throat> For example, we have to add uh, chlorine to the water to make sure that people don't get sick. And it's, it's essential. There are other techniques, but in Australia, chlorine is the way that we disinfect our networks. If we don't add enough chlorine, people will get sick. And people can even die. And there's an, an example in, uh, in Canada, where um, in Walkerton, uh, if you study water engineering, you will have heard of this, or you will hear of it, where um, the operator, based on customer feedback that didn't like the taste of water, turned the chlorine down. 
And he thought, he thought he was being customer centric. He thought he was doing a really good job. Then, because it's, it's always a chain of events, a farmer dumped a whole load of manure and whatever it was right on top of the paddock where they had the borehole. And all these bacteria found their way straight into the, uh, into the groundwater. And in this small little town of about 1,000 people, seven people died and tens of people got violently ill. So that's what we try to prevent. But on the, on the other side, if you add too much chlorine, people will have a bad taste experience. And that creates a real tension. And this is something that we still sort of, sort of struggle with, to find the right balance between marketing, between social science about customer experience, and between this engineering idea. The utilities that charge you for the water that comes out of your tap, they are perfectly entitled to run an advertising campaign that says, why don't you use our water instead? They don't. They're lazy marketers. <laughs> <laughs> so what you is often criticised um, for not providing good service because we're so, being, so engineering focused. Um, and there's an interesting example um, where about seven years ago I was teaching, in this very same campus I was teaching uh, consumer behaviour. Um, and I asked the students to, uh, to look at websites of water utilities and tell me what the brand personality is. So brand personality is a concept where you look at an organization and you say, if this organization was a person, what would their personality be? It's a very simple concept. Then they started looking at these websites and one of the water utilities had a photo of a guy swimming in sewage on the front page. Now this is an organization that sells drinking water. You go to their websites and what do you see? A man swimming in sewage. So that's probably the wrong message. But why does that happen? That happens because we as engineers are so proud of what we do. We thought it was pretty awesome, that maintenance that we did on, the, on, that, on that sewage tank, uh, where this, um, this specialized diver in specialized suits, and it's, all, it's a very complicated process with enormous amounts of chlorine to def, to, 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 for disinfection. He had to actually dive down into the sewage tank and, and fix some bolts and all that sort of stuff. And we thought, oh, that's awesome. Pe surely people want to know about that. So we put that on our website. Then. You look at that website and you go to a website of a bottled water company. What do you see? You don't see their factories. You don't see their chlorination plants or ozonation plants. What you see is scantily clad women meditating in the mountains. What you see is very happy people that are very active, skinny and beautiful. That's what they're showing you. They're showing you a perfect life. And that's what this little clip is about, is that bottled water companies seem to be able to charge an enormous amount of money, like a thousand times more than you get from tap water. And I don't know if you've seen the show, Gruen Transfer. So this is Russell Hawcroft. He's a managing executive. He said, well, body utilities are lazy marketers. And I've shown this little video to a lot of my colleagues to sort of stimulate their thinking about, but maybe we can start doing things different. And when you think back about that website, is that body utilities, and still a lot of body utilities on their websites have pictures of excavators and the fancy projects that they do, all the engineering. But what if we um, advertise it differently? And here's little example that I just downloaded some uh, stock image. Because when you think about it, what is the value that we really provide? We engineers, what is the value that we provide to society? Now, I'm sure that all of you had a, have the experience of having a shower in the morning and having the best idea ever. You probably forget about it by the time you dry yourself, but still, it's, it's this great moment of sort of waking up and the warm water. But when you think about it, that's the experience that we provide to our customers. So that's what marketing thinking can add to engineering is about changing the way you think about the benefits of what it is that you provide. Here's another example. We don't provide um, cubic meters of drinking water at a certain milligrams a liter. No, we give you customers unforgettable experiences because a lot of the water experiences that we have are quite intimate. I, I, I once told our board that they need to realize that a lot of the time our customers interact with our product, they are naked. They are in a very vulnerable position. Um, so we provide this very intimate experience. Remember this experience about gardening, how important gardening can be to people. If you understand that as an engineer, you will be able to develop better engineering products. I guess that's the, that's the main message of, uh, of my talk here. Um, I'm happy to take any questions.